Holy Gospel this morning is read from the 17th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. That, by the way, Janine and Karen happens to be one of my favorite pieces of music. How beautiful. And it's, uh, that's the title of it, and that also is how you played it. It was really, really beautiful. Thank you so much again. A few years ago, I was in Minneapolis attending a pastoral conference. I was on my way to the very first session on the very first day, walking down a sidewalk in downtown Minneapolis, when I happened to notice in front of me a group of five young men ranging in age, I would guess, from about 18 to 22 years old. Now, they didn't necessarily look like troublemakers, but by the way they were acting and carrying on, neither did they look entirely innocent. So let's just say I was a little more than cautious as I approached them. I figured if I could just keep to myself, mind my own business, keep my head down, just walk past, pretend I didn't even notice them, that everything would be fine. And so I tried to do that, but just a few steps before I got to them, suddenly one of the guys pointed up to the sky. Whoa! Whoa! What's that? Did you guys see that? That's amazing. That's incredible. Oh, my heavens, look at that. Well, as soon as he did that, of course, the other four all looked up, and they started in two. Oh, my heavens. Oh, yeah. I've never seen anything. And they, they went on and on and on. So what was I supposed to do? Clearly something incredible was happening in the sky above Minneapolis, and I wasn't about to miss it. So, I looked. Well, no sooner had I done that when the first guy, the guy who started it all with his pointing, looked right at me, clapped his hands and said, Ha! Got you, old man! <laughs> and they all laughed, and they high-fived each other. And he was right. They got me good. I couldn't do anything but just nod my head and smile at them and say, good one, and I continued on my way. Later that day, I got to thinking, what was it that, wh why did I look up? I mean, I had this sense that they were up to something, so why did I fall for it? Why did I turn and look? I just knew that they were going to do something like that. Well, I looked because I couldn't not look. If there really was something happening in the skies above Minneapolis, I didn't want to miss it. So I turned and looked, and I'm sure I wasn't the only one that day. They probably did the same trick, the same prank, to many other people who looked also that day. Part of it, I think, is that it had to do with the sky. For whatever reason, I've always been fascinated by things in the sky. Growing up in big sky country, one of my favorite things to do with my younger brothers, summer nights, warm summer nights, and clear, beautiful, cloudless nights, we would go outside and put our sleeping bags in the grass. And as we were waiting to go to sleep, we would look up at the sky, and we would look for shooting stars, and we would look for the Big Dipper, and we would look for Mars or Venus, and maybe even be graced by, sometimes by Aurora Borealis. To this day, I'm fascinated by the sky. In many ways, I think it has to do with the fact that when I look up to the sky, it reminds me how little I am in the overall scheme of things and how big God is. On July 20th of 1969, you probably remember where you were. I certainly remember where I was that day. Neil Armstrong was walking on the moon, and there I was once again, staring up at the sky. You couldn't see anything. But I was standing in my front yard, looking up, trying to even begin to comprehend what it was that was taking place up there somewhere. 
On cloudless nights, I still gaze up at the sky. I did it just the, the other night. It reminds me that as much as I think I know and understand, I really know so very little and understand so very little. Sky-gazing reminds me of the vastness of God's creation and what a gift it is to even just be a small part of it. One of the most beautiful chapters in the entire Bible, in my opinion, the eighth Psalm, was written by someone who shared that feeling, someone who, liked me, loved looking up at the sky and getting overwhelmed by the enormity of God in it all. It's not at all difficult for me to imagine that writer sitting alone one night under an amazingly cloudless, clear sky and writing the words of the eighth psalm. When I think of the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you set on their way, who am I, who are we, that you are mindful of us? Those words always get me. Written by someone after my own heart, a sky watcher, a sky watcher. And maybe there's a part of you that's like that too. Today's reading from the first chapter of the New Testament book of Acts is a story of people who also found themselves looking up, fascinated and spellbound by what they were seeing. Forty days earlier, Jesus came back to life after dying on a cross. For forty days, he appeared to his disciples, here and there, in places that were both surprising and unexpected. For forty days, he taught them and he told them about the kingdom of God and the urgency of doing their part to help make that kingdom a reality here. And now it was time for Jesus to go back into the greater fullness of God. But first he wanted to have one last conversation with his followers. His disciples must have sensed that this was it. This is the last time they were ever going to see him. And so they asked him a question that can only be described as searing. Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Now remember, the Jewish people of Jesus' time were obsessed with their chosenness. The only problem was, again and again, they kept trying to equate that chosenness with power and might. They knew what it was like to be subjected to the rule of the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans, but they also believed that God's greater plan was to turn them into the powerhouse, perhaps greater than all of those other great powers. But it hadn't happened yet, and time was slipping away. This is going to be their last opportunity to ask Jesus personally, so they had to get that question out. Before you go, Lord, is this the time you're going to make us great? Maybe their question was even bigger than that. Maybe they were going to ask, or trying to ask, when God was going to make everything right, when all the world's suffering and troubles are finally going to end, when hunger is going to stop, when wars are going to cease, when people are going to stop hurting each other. Is this the time, Lord, for all of that? Well, Jesus' answer, when you read it, it, it almost sounds a little bit cruel and certainly harsh. Basically, he says, in not so nice a language, he said, that's none of your business. And you know what? He was right. How God's kingdom, how God's reign, how God's rule comes, how God's will gets done, how God's dream is fully realized, wasn't theirs to figure out. You know what? It wasn't even necessarily Jesus' job to figure it out. In fact, wasn't he the one who said, about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Only the Father. So his followers didn't get the answer they were looking for that day, they didn't even get an answer that was particularly satisfying, but they did get an answer. Jesus addressed the underlying assumption that was made in their initial question that he was going to do it all. Listen again to the question, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? 
Jesus' response, therefore, wasn't to caution them or talk to them or teach them about predicting the coming of God's kingdom, but rather it was to impress on them the partnership with God. It's not Jesus who's going to do it. It's a partnership. God has God's job to do, Jesus is saying, and you also have a job to do. Your work is to be my witnesses here. Not only here, but to the ends of the earth. Wow. That's a big job. So go focus on that, Jesus said. It was the last earthly lesson of Jesus. And with that then, he was lifted off the ground and a cloud took him out of sight. And I can imagine that it was pretty spectacular, don't you think? And I can also imagine that those five young men in Minneapolis would really have stood speechless and in awe saying, Whoa, look at that! Being the chronic sky watcher that I am, I would have been in complete dumbfounded awe. So I get the next part of the story, and Luke is way understating what happened. Luke, the writer of Acts, simply says, they were all gazing up toward heaven. You think? Whoa! I would be right there with them. I would be one of the first ones pointing and saying, Whoa, look at that. That's unbelievable. You ever seen me? If I could speak at all. But look what happens next. And this is one of the most beautiful parts of the story. God has one more humbling and su surprise in store. As these sky-watching disciples are standing there pointing and staring, all of a sudden two men in white robes appear out of nowhere, standing right next to them, and they say, Why are you looking up to heaven? He just told you, you have work to do. Get busy. So how is that not a great story? In it we see one of the great dichotomies of being people of Christ. There's a verse in the, in the Bible, in the book of Colossians, the third chapter, second verse, that says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. In other words, we're supposed to look up. We're supposed to keep our minds and our sights and our hearts set on what's above. And yet there's another verse in Proverbs 4, verse 25, that says just the opposite. Don't look up. Let your eyes look directly forward on the mission and work that God has given you. So it seems we're supposed to be cross-eyed. One eye looking up there to the life and the hope and promises of God. One eye on the work around us that God has left us to do. And it seems Jesus didn't leave any doubt about what that work is. He said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. But listen to this. He emphasizes just how important that work is. Jesus says, this is nothing less than eternal life. That people know the one true God and Jesus Christ whom God sent. So in other words, you and I have been entrusted with a huge responsibility, a sacred, the most sacred responsibility, to make sure that people come to know God and Jesus through the words we speak, through the way we live, through the way we treat other people. Every day, you and I have the opportunity to be these witnesses for Jesus, to help someone know about the rich and full promises of God. I happen to be one who really likes Pope Francis. He once said this, he said, how beautiful, <laughs> how beautiful it would be if each of you every evening could say, today I showed a sign of love towards someone. That's the kind of work, that's the kind of work we're supposed to do. So I hadn't gone more than 50 steps beyond those five young guys in Minneapolis that morning when I heard a tremendous commotion behind me, a terrible, horrible crashing sound and a huge thud. And I thought, what is that? And I turned around and looked and maybe 30 steps behind me, there was a man who appeared to be in his 70s who had collapsed on the ground. He had somehow stumbled and in the process of stumbling and collapsing, had fallen into a garbage can, knocked the lid off, and it made a terrible cr 
crashing sound and the lid went rolling and flying and it was it was a mess and here was this poor guy on the ground holding his left shoulder as if he'd either just fractured his left shoulder blade, I mean, clavicle, or, or maybe even was having a heart attack. I don't know. It just looked, it looked horrible. So I did probably what most of you would do. I went running toward him, and what I couldn't believe is how quickly those five young men went running toward him. And suddenly their whole demeanor had changed. They weren't the pranksters anymore. There were these very compassionate, loving, understanding uh, it's just beautiful young men who went running. Are, are you okay? Are you hurt? Is there something I can do? Can I call the ambulance? Uh, is it, what can I, you know, they, they were just so concerned. You could see it on their faces and in their eyes. This genuous, genuine and tremendous concern and tenderness and compassion. Compassion. It was really impressive. Well, just as they got to him and started saying, are you okay? What can we do? Can we call an ambulance? You want to know what happened? The guy sat up, got a big smile on his face, clapped his hands, pointed at them, and said, Gotcha! <laughs> Seconds earlier, that man had seen what they had done to me, and he decided it was his mission in life not to let them do it to anyone else. And what could any of us do? We all laughed, and we high-fived, and we said, Good one, and we all went on our way, smiling. This is the work of God to be one family centered in the grace and the goodness of God, the tears and the laughter of God. To always be in awe of the enormity and beauty of the world that God has graced us to live in and care for. But to also be filled with genuine compassion for one another, as different as we might be. In other words, looking both up and sideways, cross-eyed, cross-eyed, amen.